Hi, I'm Ed Sproing. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at FlexLogic with Chen Wang, who's going to talk today about inferencing in hardware. Chen, obviously there's a lot of buzz going on these days about AI, machine learning, and also inferencing is one key piece of that. What happens on the hardware side? What's, what do we have to consider as we start building these devices to make them the most efficient and, and the fastest they can possibly go? Excellent question, Ed. As you probably know, uh, neural networks are evolving on a daily basis. Every day there's some new models and new ways to train them in order to get better precision, in order to get better hardware efficiency. There's a number of factors that goes into this. So, you know, if we are in a steady state where the model aren't evolving anymore, we can simply build a few ASICs that can be very energy efficient, execute very quickly. Everybody nowadays knows how to build ASICs. But th the problem is we are still in a very fast evolution. Um, phase of the neural network model. So many people have now still a resort to software-based solutions, either by running into CPUs or running in GPUs, just because we need to make sure that the customer can still change and program these models and update them all the time. Are we actually ever going to get to the point where these are mature enough to run just ASICs, or are there, is there always going to be change going on? It depends on the price point, especially for some of the lower end devices. Maybe it's possible because the customer might not care about the latest and greatest neural network models. But for most of the problems that we're dealing with, especially the higher value applications, we're going to need an efficient hardware that can actually execute these programmable models. It's got to be able to be upgradable, and not just for minor changes, but complete major model overhaul as well. It's got to be a programmable neural inference engine is what we need for the next foreseeable future. Why don't you draw this out for us? Yeah, sure. sure. So what are we looking at here? Okay, yeah, sure. So what we have here is just a neural network model. Um, it's one layer of a very simple uh, neural network where there's four inputs, four outputs, and 16 different weights. Of course, this is just one layer of a very complex uh, neural network, and it's highly, highly abstracted away. You know, in reality, this may have a thousand input and two thousand outputs, and therefore two million weights and something on that order, or it can be something smaller. But it will be certainly greater than a four by four with sixteen nodes here. But I would like to start with this as a as a example on how this spider web of a neural network can actually be executed onto hardware. Let's drill down into this. Why don't you show us how this is done? Yeah, sure. So there is many ways to wire up these uh, these connections in hardware so that it's computed uh, properly. Um, as you probably know already, each one of these arcs is a multiplier. So in this case, there is 16 multiplications to be done, and each one of these outputs will have to sum up uh, these. Um, each one of them has four summations for the, um, for summing up. So we can draw a um, a MAC a, a multiply accumulate, which we call MAC structure. Um, there's many kinds of MAC structures out there, uh, one dimensional, two, two dimensional, and so on. So for example, uh, in this case, we have the inputs coming in from the sides um, into 16 different multiply accumulates, and each one of these multiply accumulates is, executed, is executing a different weight value. And then um, the, the column can be summed together into leading um, into each one of the four outputs. So we can see that the input comes in horizontally, the multiplication is done in a two-dimensional fashion, and then the output comes down in the vertical column. And um, if you stare at this for a little bit, you will see that this is able to mathematically compute the neural network that we have on the left-hand side, at least for this layer. What are some of the trade-offs that you have to think about as you're starting to develop this into hardware? Excellent question. So um, there is a number of considerations. First of all is um, power, performance, and, and area, and also cost. Um, cost and area are usually uh, tied together. But we can, for example, start from this example here. Um, this is a very small 4x4 four four unit of multiply and accumulate. And you can see that in this fully populated approach, we are looking at uh, 16 multiply accumulates which may not seem like much, but when we talk about 1,000 by 1,000, it's going to be 1 million multiply accumulate here, and that's simply not feasible. And therefore, um, if we were to implement a two-dimensional structure, we're going to have to consider ways to do them in kind of a piecewise function. And 
And that's from the cost perspective. But from the performance perspective, this is highly efficient in terms of performance because every cycle, um, if this is fully pipelined, we can get a new output computed in just one cycle. Why? By using n squared number of multiplier accumulates when n is the number of inputs and outputs. And one of the things you don't want to happen is for any of these to sit idle, right, in hardware. Exactly. So, you know, though it may look very efficient to have a output every cycle or a complete set of output every cycle by having n square number of multiplier accumulates, um, the, the bandwidth to send in the data, to stream out the data, and to update these weights actually become a very big problem. So. Um, we can have many, many MAC units, but if we do not have sufficient system level bandwidth through all the memory hierarchies to keep the inputs and the weights fed, the MAC is going to have to wait. And when it's waiting, it's stalling, which will then, uti um, which will then result in a lower efficiency. So really, it's not just about how many multiplier accumulates we have in the hardware, but also what percentage of time are they actually doing useful work, and that percentage of time is, is what we call MAC utilization, and that's a very important metric we have to consider. This also determines how you build your, your hardware in terms of you want it to be right size for your application, right? Yes, it has to be right size for the application, especially um, when the application can be a very large set of neural networks. We really have to consider what, what, what trade-off can we bring in terms of balancing the bandwidth of our inputs, our, of our weights and our outputs versus um, having the most amount of MAC working and having the most amount of MAC uh, fit onto a certain unit of area. So there's a number of things at play here, and really um, one of the things as an inference engine designer here, we really want to have you know the most amount of MAC per, per, per unit area, but also we want to have them active almost all the time, if, if at all possible, and certainly much more than 50% of the time. And so running it as too sparse where you, you're not using all these different uh, elements for computing and then running it too uh, thin where you don't have enough compute elements, both of those can cause the same kind of problem, right? Exactly. So if we are running them too sparsely, we're wasting area, we're wasting silicon because the Mac um, is starved of data and just sitting idle. And if we are going in the other d uh, direction, we'll have a lot of data bandwidth coming in, but they will be waiting for the Mac to finish computing. And both of those two things is what we're trying to avoid. So there is a lot of architecture out there, but we do believe we have a very good solution at this point. And this sort of goes against the grain of how people normally think about hardware, because hardware, you always want to build margin into that, right? This is a completely different way of looking at that. Um, it is a completely different way of looking at it from many, many perspectives, right? Traditionally, people are talking of when they think about a programmable model, they're thinking CPUs and GPUs where, you know, we have a software which is there to mimic all these computes, but it's that simply too inefficient. So on the other extreme, there is hardware where it's fully fixed, where it's very efficient at doing a particular task, but neither of those two things are really ideal for a programmable neural network. We need something that is programmable, so that's software controlled, but not necessarily software executed. So um, it's something that's going to for sure lead to a new trend in hardware architecture, and I think that's also why there's so many AI startups right now. But um, in a few years, we'll see which ones are the winners that uh, prevail in terms of having the most efficient and cost-effective uh, inference and solution. What's the starting point on this designing one of these uh, um, devices? Is it the data in which way it's going to flow? Is it the hardware working backward to now we can process this data in this way? Is it a combination of both? Um, many people think that an inference engine is a MAC array. In fact, that's probably a secondary concern. The primary concern is data flow. We really have to have an efficient uh, memory access efficient data flow that will not only reduce the amount of memory access required, but certainly the amount of DRAM access that is required. And you really want to take into consideration the cost and performance and the power at the system level, which for most inference engine today is dominated by the DRAM power. So we start from, from, from um, not moving data as much as we can, and you eventually come to a max solution at the end of that problem. So or it's the opposite of m most uh, uh, computation solutions out there. Chen Wang, thanks for a great explanation. Yeah, thank you very much.